Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to this two-part tutorial series on how to build your own computer system. Now, I'll say up front that this is going to be geared more towards beginners, so we're not going to be covering the more advanced topics like overclocking or liquid cooling or any of that kind of crazy stuff. If you do have an interest in doing that, hopefully you've had at least a little prior experience in working with computer systems or building your own system. And more importantly, you need to do a whole lot of research before you begin. So you can go on the web to a source like overclock.net and use their forums to start doing your research and get some feedback and ask questions on different components before you start spending a whole lot of money on them and run into a problem later on. Now for us, we should discuss the benefits and the drawbacks to building a computer system. So from the benefits, you can, number one, select the components from specific manufacturers to build precisely what you want. And you can actually set it up to be a lot more upgradable in the future so that it'll last you longer. And in the long run, this can actually end up being cheaper. So if you take a computer that's pre-built generically from a company like Dell, for example, it might meet your needs right now, but later on you might say, hey, I want to start doing some gaming. And in order to add a graphics card to that, you need a whole new motherboard and you need a stronger power supply and at that point it just becomes cheaper to go out and buy an entire new computer system but now you've bought two computers whereas if you plan for upgrading in the future you're actually going to save yourself money because now you just need to go out and buy certain components to boost up your computer to do exactly what you want and of course in the end it can be a fun and rewarding learning experience because now you've done your research you've gotten all these parts put it together and now you have something that fully functions and you can work with and you can say hey I built this so as far as the drawbacks go uh, there's two key ones number one the lack of centralized support now again if you were to go out and buy a computer from say Dell and you had some kind of a problem you could call up their customer service and they'll help you troubleshoot it and usually they'll just replace any problems that aren't fixable over the phone for you, if you build your own computer, you're going to have to figure out exactly what the problem is and narrow it down to a specific component. And then you're going to have to contact that specific manufacturer to get any kind of troubleshooting or assistance. And the second important one is if you're going to be using the Windows operating system, you're going to need to purchase a full licensed, full install copy, which can actually run you a lot of money. Now, of course, things can break if you aren't careful in the process of putting together your system. So hopefully this tutorial will help prevent that. And you need to invest some time in researching and planning. So that's time consuming. <clears throat> so the first thing you're going to need to do when you build your system is determine what kind of a system you need. So based on your needs, do you want something that's geared more for gaming? Or are you doing a lot of photo and video editing? Are you looking to put together a simple file or web server in your house? Or are you not sure, or maybe you just want a general multi-purpose computer for browsing the web and doing a whole bunch of different tasks? So based on that, you can start to figure out whether maybe you want a specific form factor or a size. So if you want something that's going to be really small and tucked into a closet, such as, say, a file server, then you can get away with a really small form factor. Whereas if you're going to want something for gaming, you're probably going to want a tower format and maybe even a larger tower format to fit some of the cooling components or cer certain other components that you might put into it. Um, do you need specific CPU performance? So, for example, if you're doing gaming, do you need to meet certain clock speed requirements? Or if you're doing multitasking, do you need a certain core count? If you're doing heavy multitasking, of course, you're going to want to increase the amount of RAM. And if you're going to have more than 4 gigabytes of RAM, then you need to have a 64-bit capable architecture and a 64-bit capable operating system. This is kind of not really important so much anymore because most systems now do support 64-bit. So you just need to make sure that you get a 64-bit capable version of the operating system. Now again, if you're doing gaming, that means that you're going to want a better video card. If you want a better video card, that means that you need to make sure your power supply can handle it. So you're going to need a more powerful power supply. And 
to make sure that you can properly cool the system because, again, a better video card is going to crank out a lot more heat. And finally, and probably the most important, is your budget. So if you're worried about your budget, maybe the first thing you should do is go and check out the Windows licensing and pricing because that um, might take perhaps the biggest chunk out of your budget uh, or at least the second biggest, some of the video cards can run you, you know, $400 up to $1,000 or more. So just check out the Windows pricing scheme if you need to use Windows and make sure that you're looking at the full installation, not the upgrade versions, which are a little bit cheaper usually. Now some of the resources that I'll list, and we already looked at one for overclock.net, so I thought I would list it here. Um, Tom's Hardware is a great source to get reviews and feedback on different components before you buy them so you can see what other people are saying or maybe compare them with other types of hardware. Um, Micro Center is the website that I'm going to be using to do our little mock build for demonstration purpose. And then finally, a, a good resource for calculating how powerful of a power supply you need if you're going to be doing a gaming rig or something that requires you to have a separate video card you can use this website here you'll put in a whole bunch of information and it will tell you the minimum rating power supply that you should use so now let's jump ahead and open up our web browser and we'll start by going to the micro center website now, you can use Amazon, you can use any other supplier. I'm just doing this for an example. And this website is good if they have a store near you because, and the reason I like it, let's just select, uh, I'm not actually from Maryland, but if um, you go here, you can select any of their items. It doesn't even need to be computer parts specifically. And you put them all into your basket and go to checkout. And once you register an email address and some information with them, you can have them send you an email in about 18 minutes, uh, 18 to 20 minutes. And they'll say, hey, we have all of your parts here. Come and pick it up. And you print out that email or take it on your smartphone. You show it to them at the front, and they'll have all of that stuff waiting for you. So now there's no need to go and get down to finding the stuff or getting a sales associate to help you and go and dig that stuff out of the back. You'll just know once you get there, everything's already waiting for you. So I tend to use this because there's one near me. But the first thing that we had said that we need to do for our build was get a case. So let's go to our computer parts and we'll go to cases. Uh, if I can find it, here it is. And we have all of these different cases. Now, we had said that in some cases you might want uh, a small form factor. So in that situation, you would use what's known as an ITX case. And these are really small little things that you can kind of throw into a closet somewhere. You don't even necessarily need it hooked up to a monitor. So these are pretty suitable for servers, for example. But if you're going to want to do gaming, you're going to want one of these cool-looking towers. So I went ahead and selected one, and here we have a, an ATX mid-range tower case. And what you want to do is go and select your specs. And a few things you want to note are the size or the form factor. So here we have an ATX, MATX support. So this says what kind of motherboards you can put into there. And then you just want to note what other things it comes with. So if we go down here, it says what's inside of it. Um, it's just a case. It does not come with a power supply. Some of them have their own power supply built in, which is fine if the power supply is powerful enough for what you're going to need. And as we'll see later on, if you're getting your own video card, that's going to put a demand on a minimum rating for the power supply wattage. So the ones that come with the case may not actually support exactly what you need. And in this case, it actually comes with one fan with blue LED lights. So let's just go ahead and um, we'll zoom in on this. And you can see in the back, it's already got one fan mounted in it. It's got blue LED lights on it. 
the power supply unit is actually going to mount in the bottom. Sometimes they actually mount on the top. So that may or may not matter to you. And just take note of how many fans it supports. If you're going to want to do something like liquid cooling, which I'm not going to cover, but in this case, it does support it. It doesn't come with it. But you can see these two holes right here and here, which would be used for the liquid cooling system. So this case is actually pretty good. It fits what we would need for a basic build. And so the next thing that we can go and do is pick out our CPU. Now, I tend to go with the Intel processors. A lot of people swear by AMD. They say that they run cooler, which may be true, but Intel's tend to handle the heat a little bit better, in my opinion. So it's really, you do your research and determine whatever you want or what other people maybe tell you that you want to do. You can listen to them. But the important thing you want to note with the processor is the socket type. So for this Core i7, it uses the socket type LGA1155. Now some of the newer ones, if I just jump back, will support, um, let me jump ahead one, the LGA2011. But since the one that I'm going to be demonstrating in the next video is LGA1155, I figured I would go with that. Now, this says specifically that it is boxed, and in some cases you'll have unboxed or OEM versus boxed. What that means is that if we go to our specs here, if we go down, it says that it includes thermal solution or thermal compound, the fan, and the heat sink. If you get an OEM or an unboxed version, they usually don't come with this stuff, so you would have to purchase these separately. Uh, for an extra cost. So again, we want to note the socket type is LGA1155. We have our clock speed is listed for 3.1 gigahertz. The number of cores here is four. And we want to note the front side bus, which is going to limit our RAM speed and our processor data width, which is going to determine the architecture of the processor and your overall system. We said we wanted 64-bit in the case of using more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Most processors these days will support 64-bit, so it's not so much of an issue, but just note it anyway. And does it come with integrated graphics? In this case, it uses the Intel HD Graphics 4000. So we'll see what that means in one minute. But now that we've picked out a processor, using this information, we can go and pick out our motherboard. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that our motherboard is going to support. I guess I can't go back. Let me just jump back to this page here. If we go to the motherboards, we can limit it immediately to our socket type. So in our case, we have LGA 1155, so we'll click that. And now we know that we have an ATX form factor. Um, you can start to limit it based on some of the other criteria. So we had said we wanted to make it as upgradable as possible. If we only allow two memory slots, well, once we fill those two, if you want to add more RAM, you're going to have to replace memory, whereas if we have four slots available and we only use two, we can just add more RAM at a later point. So once you start to use all of this information, we can go ahead and start to narrow down based on our processor needs. So in this case, I have this uh, Z77 Extreme. It supports the LGA 1155. It's ATX type motherboard. We'll just go to the specs and take a look. It supports the Core i7, i5, and i3 family. Ours is an i7, so that checks out. It's going to support DDR3 memory. And our front side bus was at 1600. So 1600 right here is our memory. Let me just jump back to the processor here. It says memory type supported DDR3 1333 and 1600. 
So now on our motherboard, if we go, we see the memory is DDR3. It supports the 1333 and the 1600. So now we have these two choices will work out for us. It has four slots for memory. So you can see here, you have four slots. If we use two of them, again, we'll have the ability to upgrade for two more slots later on. Um, the memory specification is for dual channel. It has its own onboard graphics chipset. It has its own networking and audio built on. And here we want to note the expansion slots. In this case, we have PCI Express 3.0 X16. And this will be important for adding, especially a graphics card later on. And in this case, we can actually add three graphics cards of this um, interface type. So if you wanted to do something pretty crazy for gaming, like add uh, three video cards in an, what they call an SLI or a Crossfire setup, you could do that. It takes an ATX power connector of 24 pin. And then it also uses a four pin connector for the 12 volt. This is for the um, CPU. And I think that's about all we need to account for for this. So now uh, let's just jump to the side view and take a look at it. You can see that it has two USB ports there, another two and two there. This is an optical output for um, surround sound. And then you have your standard speaker output and inputs and microphone. Here we have an HDMI output. Um, so you can hook this up to your monitor or to your TV, for example. And then here's the various expansion slots for adding your video card later on. So. You can start out by using the onboard video and then later on if you want to do some gaming and you want to add an expensive video card you can do that so again this falls into the line of upgradability so now that we have our processor and our motherboard and our case we can go ahead and select the ram so we know that we need ddr3 either 1333 or 1600 speed so let's just jump back here. We can immediately narrow it down to DDR3. Let's go with the 1600. And you have this whole list to choose from. You can do your research and see what brand is rated the best or what other people are saying about it. So we can just select one, for example. And let's go to the specs. We can see that it comes in two separate four gigabyte modules. So you're gonna use two slots. It is 1600 megahertz speed, DDR3. And that's about all you're gonna really need to account for. So now that we have our RAM, we can optionally add a video card. And since our motherboard has onboard, sorry, wrong one, but also supports expansion later on, you don't need to do this, but the option is there if you wanna do it later on. So maybe you don't wanna spend $460 right now but in a few months, you'll have the money to do that, and you can then go ahead and buy this, but your computer will still be usable in the meantime. Just to go over for demonstration purposes, if you wanted to buy one, um, I usually use EVGA video cards, and here's a pretty decent um, card, at least for right now. It's a GeForce GTX 670 super clocked. So if you wanted to read up a little bit about that, we can copy that name and we'll go over to Tom's Hardware. And we put that in here, we search on it, and we can get a whole bunch of information for what uh, reviews are saying, what users are saying. You'll get comparisons between a couple of different cards. So based on that information, if you wanted to play a certain game, let's say you wanted to play Skyrim with all of the mods, you can go here and check out what people are saying about it. Maybe they'll recommend a different card. So once you have all of that, some of the information, and I'm not going to go over the performance measurements, that you can do your research on those other sites that we mentioned, but the things that you want to note are, number one, the... Um, the interface. So the interface here is PCI 
E 3.0 X16. So if we jump back to our main board, our motherboard, again, it said that it supported three PCI Express 3.0 X16. So as long as it supports, and again, it has two for the X16 and two more for the X8. So depending on what it requires, make sure that your motherboard can support it or vice versa. You also want to note the wattage requirement and the power connector requirement. So this card at maximum is going to draw 500 watts and it requires two PCIe 6-pin connectors. So if we go on Google, we can see these are the PCIe 6-pin connectors. And we'll see on our power supply later on why this one looks like this. But our power supply is going to need to meet both of these demands for us. And of course, you just want to note um, some of the outputs that it'll support. So it has uh, an HDMI out, which our motherboard also does, and DVI connector as well. So depending on what kind of monitor you're hooking it up to, if you need HDMI support, make, su make sure that it has an HDMI connector and all of that. So now that we have all of that, we can determine our power supply. So again, you wouldn't need a 500 watt power supply if you weren't using this graphics card. But if we only limit ourselves to say a 400 watt or 350 watt supply right now, and later on we want to upgrade to a video card like this, we're going to have to go out and buy a whole new power supply unit. So even if you're not going to use one now, you should determine what the basic uh, requirements for a video card are and use that to determine which power supply you're going to get. So here we're going to go and we see that we have a 550 watt supply which covers the 500 watts for our video card and then gives us an additional 50 watts as well. It's an ATX form factor so that's exactly what we needed. It has a 20 plus 4 pin power connector and then it also has our one 4-pin um, CPU connector, and it also has one 8-pin, which can also be used as our uh, CPU connector. For graphics connectors, we have one 6-pin and we have two 6 plus 2 pins. So I'll go back to that image. This is the 6-pin and this is the 6 plus 2 pin. And our video card said that it needed two just 6-pin connectors. So with that we can get away with using both of these and we'll just not hook this two pin connector up to anything. So let's go back to our power unit and so it meets the needs of our basic power connections, our graphics card, and now it also has eight Molex connectors, six SATA connectors, and one floppy connector. So overall this is going to be a decent power supply you're going to want to use a, a fairly decent brand so you can go and check and see what users are saying about these sometimes the fans burn out or they'll not handle power surges quite as well so just do some research to make sure that you're getting a decent power supply you don't really want to skimp on this because at the end of the day this is what's powering your entire system so once we select a power unit now we need to go ahead and get our hard drive. So in this case, um, this is pretty straightforward. You just want to make sure that it's big enough. Generally, these days, one terabyte is probably the generic size. Um, you also get different speeds. So the rotational speed internally is based on the rotations per minute. And in this case, you have 7,200. The high-end ones, you can get 10,000 and even 15,000 RPM drives. Then you have the interface connections. So you can have SATA 3.0, uh, 1.5, 6.0, which determines how fast it's going to connect between uh, your motherboard and the hard drive itself. Then you have your physical size. So this one is a 3.5 inch, some are two inch, 2.5 inch. And then of course you want an internal drive. You have 
the ability to use external drives, USB drives, but as your standard um, default primary drive, you're going to want an internal hard drive. So let's just go to the specs. It's three and a half inch. The interface is SATA 6.0, so as long as your motherboard has the ability to interface with this, you're fine. One terabyte, the size of the cache, which just helps to boost performance measurement. And then finally, there's one thing to just mention. There's also the new um, solid state drives, and they, they make some solid state um, hybrid drives. They're a little more expensive, and you can read up on it. Um, solid state are definitely a lot faster. You'll load your operating system way faster than something like this, but they do have, their, number one, they're a lot more expensive, and number two, they can, after a while, start to degrade and not work as well as they used to. I think that they've started making advancements so that that's not as much of an issue, but especially when they first came out, they only had a limited number of read and writes before they would start to really burn out and malfunction. Now, we need an optical drive, and again, these come in different form factors, so we want an interface for SATA. The other one, the older version, is IDE, but for the most part, I think uh, that's kind of phased out, and we're just using SATA now. And you have different types, so you know you have CD, you have DVD, and you have Blu-ray. And then, of course, you have the ability to just read, to read and write, and then to read, write, and rewrite. So it's pretty cheap nowadays to get a Blu-ray burner, which can do regular CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays, and it can read, write, and rewrite, I believe. So if you go here, it'll just tell you here DVD reads and write speeds and all of that information. And now, of course, um, when we talked about the processor, we had said that there was OEM versus boxed, and the OEMs don't come with their own heatsink and fan unit. So if you get an OEM one, you're going to want to go out and buy your own additional cooler. Or if you're going to be doing an overclock or a gaming computer, you might want to use a better heatsink and cooling unit than the standard one that comes with it. So in that case, you can go out and buy your own. Um, Thermaltake makes some cool ones. Here, uh, it's a little expensive, but if we take a closer look at it, you can see this is the actual heatsink portion that attaches to the processor. And then this just helps to dissipate it. There's a fan on either side and a series of cooling vents this just draws all of the heat away from the processor and helps to remove it from your system. So if you buy this, you just want to take note that, number one, it fits your processor socket. So we have an 1155. It's going to fit what we need. Uh, it tells you it actually works with the Core i7 family, Core i5, Core i3, so this is good. And Overall, it'll tell you what's in the box. So it comes with the cooler, the mounting brackets, the hardware. And in this case, it comes with its own um, thermal compound. So you don't need to buy that extra. And it comes with two fans, which are built on either side here. And then finally, if we needed some additional things, we could go here to the um, accessories for air and water cooling. This is where you would select your heat sinks, your additional fans. So you may want to pick up one or two extra fans for your case. You can get some with lights on it. Sometimes these are annoying, so you just want to get a generic regular fan with no LED lights in it. And if you needed some thermal compounds, you could get that here as well. So once you buy all of these items, again, you can add them to your cart and then check out. If this store is near you, you can go and pick it up. Otherwise, you can have it shipped to you. Or you can use a site like Amazon to get all of this stuff as well. But I just wanted to show you how each of these things can relate to each other. And you need to take note of certain different parameters when you pick up the various components. So now... Once you've picked up all of these pieces, in the next tutorial, we're going to pick up where we actually take them all and put them together into a fully functioning computer.